On July 1, 1968, the Chicago Great Western Railroad, whose origins dated back to 1835, merged with the Chicago and Northwestern and became part of American rail history. The Chicago Great Western was a mid-sized Class I railroad serving the upper Midwest. The railroad was in the general shape of a lopsided X, with Chicago, Minneapolis-St. Paul, Omaha, and Kansas City located at the four ends and the small town of Orlean, Iowa at its center. At its peak, it operated almost 1,500 miles of track in Illinois, Iowa, Minnesota, Kansas, Nebraska, and Missouri. Even though the majority of its trackage was in Iowa, with its major shops located in the Iowa town of Orlean, its headquarters were located first in St. Paul, then Chicago, and finally Kansas City. The Chicago Great Western served the agricultural and industrial base of the communities along its rights of ways, and was known primarily as a Granger Road. In its later years following World War II, it also earned a reputation as a successful bridge route moving freight between Chicago, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Kansas City, and Omaha, Nebraska. The Great Western was a railroad that some rail historians argue should never have been constructed. At the time of its beginnings, there were already four major railroads serving the same general region. The Rock Island, which ran between Chicago and Kansas City, Chicago and Omaha, and connected Kansas City with Minneapolis and St. Paul. The Milwaukee Road, which had a main line between Chicago and Minneapolis-St. Paul, and Chicago and Omaha, as well as a main line that ran through northern Iowa. The Burlington, which had a main line between Chicago, Minneapolis, and St. Paul, Chicago and Omaha, and a main line that connected Omaha with Minneapolis, St. Paul. and the Chicago Northwestern, which also had a main line connecting Chicago, Minneapolis, and St. Paul, and Chicago and Omaha. A diagram of the Chicago Great Western clearly shows that for the most part, it duplicated services that were already in place. Being in direct competition with these much larger railroads, the Chicago Great Western throughout its history had to fight for every car loading. Innovation was a necessity for the survival of the Chicago Great Western. Examples of its far-reaching thinking would include locating its major shops and classification yards in the small town of Orween, Iowa rather than in one of the major cities it served. Orwin at the time could have been considered to be in the middle of nowhere. However, it was at the crossroads of Great Western's four main lines and was an ideal location to serve the needs of the railroad. Another example was Great Western's early use of internal combustion rail cars to reduce the cost of branch line passenger service. Another example would be that in the early 1900s, just after the turn of the century, the Great Western initiated mainline improvements, double tracking and lengthening passing sidings to allow for more efficient operations. In 1929, the Great Western was the first railroad to offer combined rail air service in cooperation with Universal Airlines. The Chicago Great Western was one of the first railroads to introduce the concept of unit trains when it began operating solid trainloads of meat products. And in 1936, in response to increased competition from the trucking industry, the Great Western was one of the first of the nation's railroads to offer piggyback service. Possibly Chicago Great Western's most important cost-saving decision was the early commitment to diesel-electric locomotives. 
The railroad was completely dieselized by 1949, long before any of its competitors killed the fires on their steam engines. It is the goal of the authors of this DVD to utilize 8mm movies and 35mm slides taken in the middle years of the last century to visually document the diesel roster of the Chicago Great Western. The review of Chicago Great Western's diesel roster will begin with its yard switching locomotives. In 1947, Great Western's first yard switchers were delivered three turbocharged 1,000 horsepower Elko S2s. The S2s had the standard low hood, high cab design, which allowed for 360 degree visibility, ideal for yard switching operations. Elko's Moto S2 first came on the market in April of 1940 and was the most successful of Elko's S-Series yard switchers, with 1,376 units built between 1940 and 1950. In this film clip we see Elko S2 number 10 performing switching duties in Great Western's Chicago Yard. In this photograph we again see Elko S2 number 10 sitting alongside GP7 number 120. Both units were assigned to the Great Western's Chicago Freight Yard. In this photograph, also taken in Chicago, we see Elko S2 number 8. Number 8 was the first diesel locomotive delivered to the Great Western. It entered service in 1947. In 1948, 23 additional yard switchers joined the Great Western roster. There were five Elko S1s, 16 Electromotive NW2s, and two sets of Electromotive TR2s. The Elko S1 switchers were almost identical in appearance to the S2 types, but lacking a turbocharger, they developed only 660 horsepower rather than 1,000. The S1 was somewhat of a rare locomotive, only 535 were built in its 10-year production span from April of 1940 to June of 1950. The Electromotive NW2s were 1,000 horsepower units Similar in appearance to the Elko switchers with low hoods and high 360-degree cabs. The NW2s were also a popular locomotive 
with 1,131 units in service on American and Canadian railroads. Here we see examples of two of the Great Western's paint schemes. NW number 24 is wearing the simplified maroon paint job introduced in the 1950s. Number 20 is still wearing the as-delivered paint scheme. It took a lot of horsepower to make up 200 car freight trains. In this film clip we see 2,000 horsepower being provided by a pair of NW2s. The Chicago Great Western was only one of seven railroads that had Electromotive TR2s on their roster. The TR2 was a variation of Electromotive's line of switchers, first introduced in 1940. The designation TR stood for transfer. They were developed to fill a railroad need to move trains from one yard to another, as well as to perform normal switching duties. Basically, the TRs were two standard NWs connected by a drawbar, the second unit without a cab, identified as a booster. The units became known by rail fans as cows and calves. This TR unit is wearing the solid red paint job, which became prevalent in the 1960s. In 1949, the Chicago Great Western bought its only diesels from the Baldwin Locomotive Works. 14 1,000 horsepower DS441000 type yard switchers. It is interesting to note that in 1949, Baldwin was still building steam locomotives. So the designation DS stood for diesel switcher. Baldwin had a very simple way of identifying its locomotives. The numbers after the DS, 441000 indicated four axles and four traction motors. The last yard switchers purchased by the Great Western were 16 additional TR2s from Electromotive. In 1946, a set of Electromotive F3 freight demonstrator cab units toured the Chicago Great Western. It was perfect timing for the sales staff of Electromotive. Chicago Great Western steam locomotives were worn out from the traffic demands of World War II. Even their modern Texas types, the pride of the road, were in need of major repairs. Orders followed and in 1947 24 F3s were delivered, the first of the Chicago Great Western's fleet of covered wagons. Electromotive F3s were 1500 horsepower units, successors to EMC's revolutionary FT. They were truly the first totally flexible locomotive offered by Electromotive. They could be geared for high-speed passenger trades as well as slow-speed drag service. They could be found on railroads all across the country, from the Atlantic coastline to the Southern Pacific, from the Great Northern to the Santa Fe. Chicago's Great Western F3s, like most of the 1807s sold, were geared for normal freight service. F3s were marketed by Electromotive as independent A- and cabless B units that could be grouped together to provide horsepower as needed by the railroads. The Great Western was well known among rail fans for grouping six 
or even seven F units together to get enough horsepower to pull their 200 car trains. In this photograph we see what was identified as a Type 2 F3. It was distinguished by side panels with two portholes, no filter grill, and chicken wire extending down between the portholes and running the full length of the body above the portholes. The Type 2 F3s were produced from mid-1947 to mid-1948. They were typical of the units delivered to the Chicago Great Western. In the early 1950s, the Great Western began a program simplifying the paint scheme on its locomotives. The result was a solid maroon paint scheme that lasted to the 1960s when it was replaced with a bright red. The solid red color utilized on this F3 was the last paint scheme used by the Great Western prior to its 1968 merger. During its five-year production cycle from 1945 to 1949, the F3 went through a series of design modifications. However, for most rail fans, the Type 2 F3 with the open chicken wire sides typified the standard F3 model. It was this characteristic that allowed rail fans to identify the F3. In these next two photographs we see a Chicago and Great Western freight with six F units at the head end. In the first photograph we see the freight leaving the Great Western Yard, which was located about one mile west of Chicago's downtown area. In the second photograph, we see it highballing through Chicago's western suburbs. It is easy to see the F3 lead unit, the four F7B units, and the trailing F7A unit. This train was typical of the way the Great Western operated its freights in and out of Chicago. Although the 200 car freights with multiple F units were fan favorites, there were downsides to this method of operating. Often, the trains would sit in the yard for extended periods of time until enough freight cars could be gathered to make up the train. In this film clip we see an F3 and five sister F units still in the solid maroon paint job, leaving the Great Western's Chicago yard. Once again we see an F3 leading a six unit eastbound freight. This time it has piggyback cars. In these next two film clips, both taken in Chicago's western suburbs, we see typical Great Western freights with six units led by an F3, one taken on a below zero day in the middle of winter and the other on a sunny summer afternoon.
1948, in addition to the yard switchers it purchased, eight Elko RS2 road switchers joined the Great Western roster. The American Locomotive Company, Elko, was the first to develop what became known as the road switcher concept, a locomotive designed for switching as well as mainline operations with components located for accessibility and ease of maintenance. The initial design, identified as the RS-1, predated World War II, but its development was hindered by war restrictions. Elko introduced the 1500 horsepower RS-2 in 1946. In this June of 1973 photograph, we see a well-worn and battle-weary RS-2 after 25 years of service. In 1949, the Chicago Great Western diesel roster gained an additional eight Elko RS2s, 16 Electromotive F5s, and the first 11 of its F7 fleet were delivered. These units allowed the complete dieselization of the Chicago Great Western. In this photograph, we see what the Chicago Great Western identified as an EMC F5. The Great Western was one of the few railroads that used the identification F5. The units were actually F7s with F3 traction motors, a transition between the two models. In this film clip, we see one of the Great Western F7s leading a six-unit freight eastbound into Chicago. EMD's F7s were a continuation of the F-Series. The F7s were rated at 1,500 horsepower, the same as the F3, but internal improvements increased the pulling power by approximately 30%. The F7 was the most popular of Electromotive's F-Series with 3,849 units constructed during its five-year production run. In 1950, eight additional F7 units joined the Great Western roster. Also in 1950, the Great Western purchased its only passenger diesel electric locomotives. The Great Western never purchased any diesels that were designed only for passenger service. Rather, it dieselized its passenger runs with dual-purpose FP7s. The FP7 was almost identical in appearance to the F7. The only difference was four feet of increased length added to the unit behind the first porthole. The increased length was used for water tanks to supply the steam generator necessary for passenger operations. The Great Western had a proud history of passenger service, including the Great Western Limited, providing fine dining and sleeping cars between Chicago and the Twin Cities, the Bluebird, Legionnaire, Minnesotian, and a series of Limiteds operating between the major cities it served. However, by the time it received its FP7s, its passenger service was greatly reduced. The economic realities of improved highways and Increased automobile ownership were becoming apparent. One by one, the passenger trains were eliminated. By 1956, all passenger routes in Illinois were discontinued. And by the end of the year 1965, the last passenger service, a single round trip between Omaha and the Twin Cities, was terminated. The Great Western became freight only. In their later years, the FP7s could be seen leading freights on the Chicago Main Line. Here we see an FP7 leading a six-unit eastbound piggyback train. In this film clip, taken in Great Western's Chicago Yard, 
we see a Baldwin yard switcher setting up a six unit freight. The lead unit is an FP7. The FP7 is followed by two F3B units, an F7B unit, an F3B unit, and finally an F7B unit in front of the piggyback cars. It was trains like this that made the Chicago Great Western a rail fan's favorite. Great Western's purchases of first-generation diesels ended in 1951 with the acquisition of the last four F7s and two Electromotive GP7 road switchers. The GP designation standing for general purpose. The GP7 was Electromotive's entrance into the road switcher market. Although it followed Elko's RS series by almost eight years, because of EMC's design, production, and marketing, it quickly overtook the RS2 in sales. When the GP7 first came on the market, there was a story that the EMC design engineers thought the locomotive was too utilitarian looking and that the railroads who were used to having streamlined locomotives would never purchase it. However, because of the units Versatility and ease of maintenance, it was an immediate success. A success so great that the GP7 and its successor units resulted in the elimination of F-style freight cab units from the Electromotive catalog. Electromotive's F-series freight cab locomotives, which began with the FT in 1939, ended in 1957 when the last F9 unit left Electromotive's LaGrange manufacturing plant. In this film clip we see one of the Great Western GP7s doing switching at the Great Western Chicago yard. The locomotive has been repainted in Great Western's solid red paint scheme. In this photograph, we see a GP7, still in the original paint scheme, silhouetted against an evening sky. Chicago Great Western's purchase of second generation diesels began 12 years later in 1963, with the acquisition of eight Electromotive GP30s. The turbocharged GP30s produced 2,250 horsepower and came equipped with dynamic brakes. The GP30s were a distinctive locomotive. A raised section of the hood top, running from the cab to the forward end of the radiator grills, distinguishes the GP30 from all other EMD road switchers. As illustrated in this photograph, the Great Western often ran the GP30s in four-unit sets. Producing 9,000 horsepower, they were the equivalent of six of the first-generation covered wagons. In this film clip, we see a four-unit GP30 freight with an F7 unit stuck on the end. Maybe they had a few extra cars.
1966, the Chicago Great Western bought its final new diesels, nine EMD SD40s, SD standing for Special Duty and indicating that the units had six-wheel trucks. The 3,000 horsepower SD40s were the first and only six-wheel units on the Great Western roster. We conclude our review of the Chicago Great Western Diesel roster with this film clip taken after the merger with the Chicago Northwestern. Two former Chicago Great Western SD40s, renumbered in the Chicago Northwestern numbering sequence, are in a four-unit lash-up on the ready tracks in Chicago Northwestern's provisional yard in Chicago's western suburbs. Following the merger, the diesel roster of the Great Western was absorbed into the Chicago and Northwestern, working in various locations throughout the Northwestern system. In this section, we will share some photographs of former Great Western diesels working for the Northwestern. In this first photograph, we see a former Great Western NW2 calf unit working in the Northwestern's Twin Cities yard in a photograph taken in June of 1979. This is former Great Western NW2, number 23, in April of 1976, working Northwestern's Provisal Yard. Northwestern's Provisal Yard was located about 15 miles directly west of downtown Chicago, it was Northwestern's major facilities within the Chicago region and is still operated by the Union Pacific. In this June of 1979 photograph, we see former Great Western RS2 number 54, now in Chicago Northwestern colors, working a Northwestern yard in Huron, South Dakota. Former Great Western RS2 number 51 has been rebuilt by the Northwestern into a booster unit. When this photograph was taken in June of 1979, it was being operated on mainline freights scheduled out of Tracy, Minnesota.
former Great Western F3 number 101C, was captured outside the engine house in Northwestern's Provisal Yard in September of 1980. Northwestern F3 number 211, formerly Great Western number 112C, is leading a freight outside the small Minnesota town of Wasika in a June of 1979 photograph. In another photograph taken in Northwestern's Provisal Yard in April of 1976, we see F3 number 214 formerly Great Western number 114A, sitting on the ready tracks, waiting for its next assignment. In this April of 1976 photograph, we see former Great Western F3 number 115A as the trailing unit on an eastbound freight heading down Northwestern's three-track mainline towards Provisal Yard. In these next three photographs, we see Northwestern TR2 number 1035 working the rail yard in Green Bay, Wisconsin. 1035 was formerly Great Western number 58A. This strange looking unit was once Chicago Great Western DS441000 number 36. The Northwestern has rebuilt it into a booster unit and numbered it BU-18. Here we see former Chicago Great Western SD-40 number 409 now numbered Chicago Northwestern 929, sitting on the ready tracks in Provisal Yard. We'll close this section on Chicago Great Western repaints with a close-up view of number 1015. Number 1015 was Chicago Great Western 63A, the lead unit on a TR2 cow and calf. It's no wonder that 1015 looks a little worn for wear. It has been in service for over 20 years, years since the Chicago Great Western faded into history. Following the 1968 merger with the Chicago Northwestern, most of Great Western's main lines were abandoned. It was estimated that the Northwestern operated less than 10% of the former trackage, 
most of it in the diagonal route to Kansas City. In the Chicago region, all remnants of the Great Western have disappeared. The Great Western Main Line has become the Great Western Trail, part of a regional walking and bicycling trail system constructed on abandoned rail lines. Great Western Chicago right-of-way has been paved for bicycles. The overgrown natural vegetation separates it visually from the communities through which it passes. It is sad to realize that most of the thousands and thousands of people that use the trail annually have never heard of the Great Western nor even realized that there were tracks where they walk. However, the old-time rail fans that walk the trail among the joggers and the children on bikes still keep a sharp ear out for those covered wagons.